Welcome back, defenders, defenders of truth, defenders of democracy. Currently, we're on year two of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine, and Ukraine needs your continued support. The top story today has to be the destruction of this Russian plane at an airstrip in Belarus. So Belarus's exiled opposition said Sunday that partisans had destroyed a Russian plane at an airstrip near the capital city of Minsk. Except this wasn't just any old Russian plane. This was an A-50 mainstay, which is a Soviet airborne early warning and control aircraft. What is an AWAC do? And the A-50 can control up to 10 fighter aircraft for either air-to-air -air intercept or air-to-ground attack missions. So this plane has to be in the air for other planes to effectively uh, carry out their missions. So who exactly attacked this plane? And it was done by BIPOL, B-Y-P-O-L, who is BIPOL, and they're the Association of Security Forces of Belarus, a Belarusian organization that was created by former employees of law enforcement agencies to counter the Belarusian government. The initiative opposes the dictator, President Lukashenko. So I imagine that Putin and the Russian military is not happy about one of their prized planes being destroyed on Belarusian territory. So this plane is worth an estimated $500 million. Russia previously sold two of them to India for a total of $1 billion, making the plane valued at about $500 million. So how it was destroyed was there were cheap drones dropping some kind of explosives while the plane was parked outside on the, on the taxiway. To put this in perspective, the Black Sea Fleet flagship Moskva cost an estimated $750 million. So following the sinking of that ship, the destruction of this A-50 recon plane is the second largest single loss for the Russian military, costing them $500 million. Russia does not have the capacity to build more of these planes. They were built in the Soviet era. So Russia only had seven of these planes, and now they're down to six. This is a huge disaster for the Russian military and the Russian Air Force. So let's check in with the front lines, and the city of Bakhmut continues to hold. However, it's getting a little, a little perilous. You can see that the river that runs through the city, everything east of the river, is now contested. Russian forces are basically in this shaded gray region, and they've firmly controlled, you can see, several city blocks in this residential area. But the territory that they've taken in Bakhmut They've completely destroyed. There is a recent drone video of what the east of the city looks like. Uh, I'm not going to play the sounds. There's gunshots and artillery going off in the background. I'll put this video in a pinned comment down below if you want to check it out for yourself. But every building has been destroyed. The city is in ruins. The roads are worthless. Every tree is dead. All the people are gone. Uh, this is what Russia views as a victory. This is the only way their military can advance if they destroy every structure and kill every person. This is Ruski Mir. This is what Russia does when it uh, expands. So with the progress on the ground for the Russians being so slow, even trying to take the city of Bakhmut, on Kremlin State TV, they're struggling to fill 24 hours of broadcast time, 24 hours of news. So Russian propagandists are getting pretty interesting, attempting to explain to the Russian people why this special limited military operation is now on year two. So I've got a couple clips for you. They're unbelievable. We'll start with this woman explaining why they chose, why the Russian military chose not to take Kyiv in three days. Что Киев так до сих пор и не был взят за три дня. 
как обещал, как, как прогнозировал американский генерал Марк Милли. Но о том, что это были слова американского генерала, на Украине все предпочли забыть. Поэтому все, они, они там рассказывают, что мы, оказывается, планировали Киев за три дня взять. Но я повторюсь, если бы мы хотели это сделать, мы бы это сделали. Чем сделали бы это, наверное, так же. We all know the expression God works in mysterious ways. That's basically the position that this propagandist has taken, stating that if Putin wanted to take the capital city of Kiev in three days, he could have done it. But Putin chose not to do it. Putin works in mysterious ways, and like God, it's not the position of the Russian people to question Putin's master plan for the Russian nation. Oh my gosh. Here's the next clip from a different propagandist, and he has a different spin on why Russia did not capture Kyiv in three days. Если кто-то вдруг разочаровался в том, что а, не было такой вот а, стремительной победы в три дня, это ваши личные проблемы. Я скажу больше. Я скажу больше. Хорошо, что она не случилась в три дня, потому что если бы она вдруг случилось бы в эти самые условные три дня, мы пребывали бы в том же самом радужном, ложном, фальшивом ощущении нашего всемогущества о том, что наша политическая жизнь удалась. Но нет, не только наша личная, а вот э, всей, всего российского государства в том виде, в том состоянии, в котором оно подошло к 24 февраля 2022 года. А с моей точки зрения, Россия подошла к 24 февраля 2022 года в состоянии такого тяжелого, запущенного э, философского идеологического кризиса. Мы перестали видеть цель. So this guy is arguing that, thank God, thank God we didn't accidentally capture Kiev in three days, because that would have been too easy. We would have lost our sense of purpose. We would have lost our sense of why we exist at all. This war lasting multiple years is good for Russia, good for the Russian people the longer it goes on. That is what he's arguing. He also said we would be in the same rainbow sense of, of, of false omnipotence. Wow. All right, one more clip of Russians trying to explain why taking Kiev in three days would have been a bad thing for their country. А теперь представь себе, что победа великая. И взяли и всю, или там большую часть этой самой несчастной Украины, присоединили тем или иным способом. Понимаете, сколько будет стоить все это восстанавливать и проверить в порядке. При том, что в этот раз Запад уже ни копейки не вложит. То есть экономический ущерб от предполагаемой назовем это победой, будет в разы больше самого тяжелого поражения. Вот вам наглядный пример того, куда мы попали. Ну, то есть, по сути... So this guy argues how expensive it would have been to capture all of Ukraine. Can you just imagine how costly it would have been for the Russian government if they had taken all of Ukraine? And how much money Russia is saving by just uh, scaling back only taking the Donbass, only taking the land bridge, and ignoring the rest of the country. This is a huge benefit to Russia because they're saving so much money on not having to rebuild Ukraine. So propagandists are going to say insane things on Russian state TV. It's up to the Russian people watching their programs whether or not they want to believe it. Uh, so for the average Russian... They can either face reality that their special limited military operation on year two is a complete disaster, or they can dive nose first into a huge pile of copium. Uh, copium is a hell of a drug. I, I don't know what to say about the Russian people watching these excuses for why the war is now on year two. But the reality is, is that the Russian military is getting destroyed. Uh, they've lost half their tank fleets. Casualties have to be over 100,000 dead. Uh, here's an article, Russian tanks reverting to Cold War thermal sites. A near-antique 
Russian T-62 was seen sporting a decades-old thermal sight as Russian forces scrape the barrel for capable armored vehicles. So a T-62 went into service in 1962, so this was 60 years ago, and they're using sensors and equipment from 1983. So we have tanks being used by Russians today that were built 60 years ago with equipment from 40 years ago. That's how bad this war is going for the Russians. It is not, not going well. Vladimir Putin has accused the West of seeking to dismember Russia. He made these comments during a TV interview. Let me show you about 40 seconds of this clip. У них одна цель – раскассировать бывший Советский Союз и его основную часть Российскую Федерацию. И потом, может быть, они и примут у нас в так называемую семью цивилизованных народов. Но только отдельно. Понимаете? Каждую часть отдельно. Для чего? Для того, чтобы помыкать этими частями и поставить под свой контроль. Если мы пойдем по этому пути, я думаю, что судьба очень многих народов в России – и прежде всего, конечно, русского народа, могут кардинально поменяться. Ну, просто кардинальным образом. Я не знаю даже, сможет ли сохраниться такой... So I want to say that prior to this invasion of Ukraine, nobody was trying to dismember Russia. Nobody in the West or NATO was trying to break up Russia. But given Russia's inclination towards authoritarianism and genocide, the breakup of Russia might now be non-negotiable in order for, yes, Russians to be returned to the uh, group of civilized nations for sanctions to be lifted. There's about 140 million people in Russia. Russia might just have to be broken up into about 14 different states of about 10 million people each. It's the only way to stop Moscow from just doing this again. And this isn't really a big deal. If you think about how many countries in the world speak Arabic, they share a language, they share a religion, yet we've got close to 20 different countries, each with their own regional governments and separate populations. This is the remnants of a Arabic empire. Same thing with Spanish. How many countries in the world speak Spanish? Predominantly, they're also Catholic, the same religion, yet we've got close to 20 different countries. It's okay to speak the same language, have the same history, share the same religion, and be a separate country. Same is true for English. Just because all of these countries share the same language, do they have to be the same country? And the answer is no. This is the remnants of the British Empire. This is the remnants of the Spanish Empire. The last empire after World War II that was never broken up was the Russian Empire. And Putin is trying to <laughs> rebuild it, expand it, and he's willing to commit genocide to do it. So I don't know how this is going to end for Russia over the next couple years, but Putin is probably right that uh, the Russian people will not be allowed back into the world order of civilized nations until they break up and probably denuclear denuclearize just a little bit. I don't think all of these countries are going to be allowed to keep nukes. Moscow might keep some, but they can't have 6,000 anymore. That's absurd. And this war can now only end one way with a complete... Russian military defeat, all Russian military soldiers are going to have to withdraw from Ukrainian territory. This includes Crimea. President Zelensky, on the nine-year anniversary of Russia's occupation of Ukraine, we will return it. Uh, GLSDB with 150 kilometer range, it's coming this summer, June, July, August, and there will be no sanctuary for Russian soldiers anywhere on occupied territory. And if there's any ambiguity about NATO or the United States' position on Crimea, the U.S. State Department put out this press release yesterday simply saying Crimea is Ukraine. The West is going to support Ukraine if they choose to send their military to retake Crimea. 
Russia is not going to be able to keep any seized territory. So the Russians really aren't happy, and let me share this propaganda video that they recently made. <laughs> произвела Россию только одну. Она соперниц не имеет. Okay, there's a lot to break down in this Russian propaganda clip, but the first thing that has to be said is that this was not a fair fight. This is Volgograd's Motherland Calls Monument battling the Statue of Liberty, but Lady Liberty is only armed with a book and a torch. A torch to guide the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. This potato-eating statue went to our New York City and attacked an unarmed woman with a sword. So really, this propaganda clip is right on brand for Russia, uh, killing defenseless civilians. But this is the kind of propaganda that Russia makes, viewing itself as equal to the United States, that the United States is their ultimate enemy, and that they're going to defeat, kill, destroy the United States. So when American propagandists such as Tucker Carlson make excuses for Russia and defend Russia, they're supporting Russia over their own people when Russia nightly on state TV talks about nuking Yellowstone National Park or the San Andreas fault line to kill millions of Americans. People like Marjorie Trader Greene uh, defending Russia, saying that Ukraine is actually the, uh, the evil country that shouldn't be supported. Russia is misunderstood. Russia are not, they're not our enemy. Yeah, just send them this clip and see what they say. We've got some good news for Ukraine as the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Saudi Arabia met with President Zelensky. So they had a, a nice sit-down meeting with uh, Saudi officials and members of Ukraine's government. Why did the Minister of Foreign Affairs come to Kyiv? And he came uh, with a $400 million aid package. So this is fantastic news. That's a lot of money. The Saudis have a lot of money. But why is Saudi Arabia choosing to support Ukraine? And it's to counter Iran. Iran's barter of military assistance to Russia grows deeper. Military cooperation between Moscow and Tehran is growing, which is bad news for Ukraine, says the National Security Council. Lots of talk about proxy war here, proxy war there. For Russia, this is not a proxy war if they <laughs> attacked Ukraine and are directly involved. But two countries where this might really be the true definition of a proxy war is Saudi Arabia and Iran. Iran backing Russia, Saudi Arabia backing Ukraine and the NATO alliance. My opinion is that Russia is not going to win this war, and this is bad news for Iran as when Russia collapses, Iran will be more deeply isolated than ever. Uh, nobody is going to have sympathy for Iran after this war is over. Last couple feel-good clips I have for you. The first one is with uh, Ukraine's intelligence chief. This is Budinov. And uh, this Ukrainian journalist uh, notices a cat in his office. So this is a cat that survived a rocket attack that the uh, intelligence director uh, adopted himself, calling this a strategic battle cat that knows more state secrets than any other cat in the country. Final clip I have for you. This honestly might be one of my most favorites that I've ever shown you guys, but it's a Ukrainian defender doing a magic card trick. 
Дама Христа. Дама Христа. Ну, нормально перетасую лапу. Давай! Мене вже її припалували. По-любому. Та вже можна нормально перетасувати. Це що ви кажете? Стоп. Ні, це ти мав, так? Ні. Як ні? Ні, ні. Червова дев'ята. Ну, якщо червова дев'ята. Ну, так, щоб ти сидів. Ну, я? Я потрусив. Забере мене А що Саня? Ukrainian defenders have many skills, magic being included among them. That's all for this update video. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. If you found this video informative, Give me a thumbs up, best way to support the channel. Comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Until the next video, keep defending the truth, keep defending democracy.